You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast featuring some of Indiana's most fascinating men and women whose impact has shaped our state, our communities, and us. Join us as we discuss their imprint on our history. Leaders and Legends is brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated, your local veteran business enterprise specializing in public relations, media relations, public outreach, crisis communications, and digital photography. My name is Robert Bain, Principal of Veteran Strategies, former Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Greg Ballard, and Communications Director for the Indiana Republican Party. I'm honored to be your host for our discussion. Thank you for joining us today on Leaders and Legends. We're with Ryan Vaughn, uh, someone who has held numerous positions of authority, influence, and quite candidly, I don't know that anyone has done any of those jobs better than he has. Thank you, Ryan. It's a nice way of saying I can't keep a job. Now. Well, you know, when you when you think about your contemporaries, right, and I think I'm about 10 years older than you. I'm 51, you're 40. 40. And you think about the folks who you've worked with and, and whose orbit you've you've been in one way or the other. I just don't know that any of us our age on the Republican side, especially think any hi- more highly of anyone than they do you, whether it's I talked to Okison about you or Ballard or anyone, Dudich, all of our friends. Uh, you're just kind of universally like, OK, this guy has got it and we appreciate your time. Well, that's, that's fantastic and very kind. Happy to be here. Well, you currently helm and I want to talk about sports first and then we'll go back a little bit. Uh, the Indiana Sports Corp. It is one of the most impactful organizations in the city. Tell us a little bit about what it does and what you do. Yeah, the Indiana Sports Corp is a really special institution for Indianapolis. Um, It was founded in 1979 and was actually the first sports corporation in the country. So the whole notion of creating an organization like this to attract sports organizations and sports events to your city didn't really exist in a a specific intentional way before that. Uh, and we were founded in 1979 really to address um, a, a problem that most major cities in America were having, which was this massive suburban flight and deinvestment in the urban core um, and sort of the, the fall of cities. And the idea was, um, you know, the founding fathers, the Jim Morrises, Michael Brownings of the world, um, Ted Bohms came together and said, hey, we need a specific strategy aimed at revitalizing our downtown or keeping it vibrant because it's the core driver of our state economy. Um, and sports is a good way for us to do that. And so, you know, we kicked off um, in the late 70s um, and really got, you know, the state, the city, uh, philanthropy uh, with the Lilly Endowment and corporate leadership to invest in building facilities and attracting organizations to downtown. And since then, um, you know, it's been just a tremendously successful strategy of which I'm just lucky to sort of be the, the the man leading the effort now. In 79, for those of you who aren't familiar, it was really on the very beginning of, and you correct me if I'm wrong, the sports emphasis, tourism convention emphasis of downtown, of Indianapolis. Um, was it formed specifically to win a particular event, I think it was 1980. The Final Four was here when Louisville won the final, won the NCAA championship. Was it formed like around that? Well, in 1979, Congress passed the um, National Sports Act, um, which actually created what you now know as national governing bodies. So, USA, fill in the blank: gymnastics, sure. football. You know, uh, many of these organizations were created, and so one of the purposes of the Sports Corp was to be the organization that would attract these newly formed. Uh, companies, nonprofits in sports to choose Indianapolis as a, pl- a place to locate. And um, they did that very successfully. We're still home to USA Gymnastics, USA Football, uh, USA Diving, USA Track and Field, uh, some of the largest uh, Olympic sports. Um, so I don't think we were formed around a sp- particular event, um, but there was a recognition among the corporate leadership and civic leadership that there was a need for a, an organization to sort of specifically focus on handling things like attracting those events or organizations. And when you right before we started recording, you talk about how much travel you do in the first quarter of the year. How many cities or states do you travel that have the same organization? And what do you hear about Indianapolis? One of the things that I've asked all the guests on the Leaders and Legend podcast is 
what other cities and states and, and leaders in those places, what they say about Indianapolis, because obviously it's dramatically different than what they said about Indianapolis 50 years ago. Sure. What, do you, what do you hear about the city and how we do things and our people? Yeah, we enjoy a, an incredible reputation in the world of hosting major events, sports and otherwise. Um, we really do have a great history. We have a, an infrastructure here um, of professional people like the Sports Corp. Um, and visit Indy, but we also have, um, you know, great volunteerism, uh, really unmatched volunteerism. It's, it is, uh, it is the exception rather than the rule. And most other cities, when I go and visit or I attend these major events, uh, there's always a talk about, you know, the struggle they have with getting a 50% turnout rate for their volunteers for these majors events. And, you know, in the Super Bowl, we had 3000 people that registered to volunteer that we didn't have a job for, but it's the <laughs> exact opposite problem. Um, and it's really, uh, I think it probably dates back to the Pan Am Games in 87. The community has just really bought in um, to this mission and really supports it in a big way. Uh, and we also really have um, uh, the ability to work together that is uncommon in other major cities. Um, you know, the corporate, the city, the state, um, other philanthropy that come together to really rally around an event. Um, in other cities, there's a lot of uh, turf battles. You know, when I went out to Dallas for the Super Bowl before ours, um, you know, you couldn't get Dallas to talk to Irving to talk to, you know, they, right. they different governments. Um, they didn't like each other. They were constantly jealous of one another. The public safety didn't work well together. Um, all those turf wars, none of that exists here. Um, part of that's the brilliance of Unigov, by sure. the way. You only have to deal with one unit. Um, but part of that is also, too, is just sort of the, the ethos of the Midwest and the way we work together, I think. Did you... Did you find, because I, I want to follow up on that, but before I forget, you talked about the Super Bowl. How much has the fact that, I, I, I mean, you'd have to be horribly cynical and jealous not to uh, say that Indianapolis took the Super Bowl and put it someplace it had never been before, literally and figuratively. How much does that help you? Or how much does does it happen when you go to Minneapolis or Cincinnati or St. Louis where someone goes, you know, Ryan, I came to the Super Bowl in Indianapolis and I simply can't believe what you guys did. How much does, does that help? The image of the city. Uh, extraordinary. Uh, really, really extraordinary. I mean, especially from a media standpoint, um, you know, Final Fours, you know, we'll, we'll have about, you know, 2,600 credential media from around the world. Um, a Super Bowl is probably closer to 9,000, right? So these are people that, um, and you know this, and, and, it, and it's one of the biggest challenges we face as a community. It's very difficult to get people to come here who don't know anything about Indianapolis or Indiana, but once they do, they fall in love with it. And so having a moment where people were um, desirous and compelled to be here professionally because they were covering the Super Bowl was huge because they were just absolutely blown away by it, and they still talk about it to this day. Uh, you know, the Super Bowl is the most recent example, but I referenced the Pan Am Games. It's funny, even in the sports world today, how many people still talk about how great those Pan Am Games were relative to other Pan Am championships that take place. And that's come up before, particularly in our podcast with uh, Bill Benner. We're here at Leaders and Legends with Ryan Vaughn, president of the Indiana Sports Corp., former president of the Indianapolis City County Council, and former chief of staff to Mayor Greg Ballard. That came up before in some of our other and it was funny, too, because I was stationed at Fort Ben Harrison going through AIT, going through journalism school, and we had to move out because they were housing the athletes there. I don't know which ones. And literally no one – like we didn't know what the Pan Am Games were. It seems crazy now, but at the time we just had no conception why do you think the Pan Am Games made such a huge difference? Because Bill Benner made that same point, that that really put Indianapolis on the map. I think it was the volunteerism and the community engagement. Um, it was thinking through, you know, we were not in a place, um, you know, I, I obviously was like nine years old, so I'm, I'm talking in history here. But <laughs> we, we were not in a place where we had uh, a sports corp like we do today with 25 full-time professional event people working on this. We had uh, community volunteers that came together uh, and really owned all of this and recognized very quickly that if we wanted to make it special, in order to be successful, we were going to have to have thousands of people in the community engaged in what we were doing. And that seems to be... Um, sort of the starting point of this this uh, commitment to it. And, and when you get the community involved in what you're doing and they get to see, you know, the athletes from across the country, you give them a platform to sort of demonstrate that Hoosier hospitality, you own it more, right? Sure. You, you as a community own it more and it becomes this, um, um, you know, self-rewarding 
uh, thing where, where, where volunteerism becomes super important. I mean, you feel good about yourself and about your community when you're out serving it, right? And so I think that that platform that the Pan Am Games gave us was just huge because there were tens of thousands of people that volunteered. Really incredible. And I remember not not traveling per se, but but in the Army when I was stationed in New Mexico, everybody comes, you know, from other parts of the country. And it was weird, too, because I remember on race day, 1987, or excuse me, 1988, I could watch the race live because it's not blacked out in Las Cruces, New Mexico. But when you, the people who came up and would talk to me and you'd say where you're from, their only reference was the 500. That was the only thing they had, really. And now there's so many more. Uh, Right after, I believe, the Big Ten championship of a couple months ago, the Big Ten football championship, uh, Mike Greenberg from ESPN tweeted to his, I don't know, 2 million followers, literally 2 million followers, Indy is the best big game city in the country. How does that make you feel? Does that help you sell Indianapolis? And is that like, wow, that's the kind of validation we need to be able to market Indianapolis for all these other events? It, for, cert, for certain, it helps us sell the city. Um, and, and that validation, you know, it's actually part of our strategic plan is to find ways to seek that third party validation that, you know, we're arrived, we're the best, we can do it. Um, Cause you're always, you know, you always want to fight with a little bit of a chip on your shoulder and we're, you know, when you well, look, you're battling the big boys in right. places like Orlando and Chicago and New York and LA and San Antonio. Yeah. And you know, uh, Dallas, Atlanta. Uh, there, I mean, there's a lot of big, big cities out there, two, three times our size competing right alongside of us for these events. And so, um, whether it's fair or not, uh, we always have to walk in with our resume and these third party validations from people who experience all of these events in all these cities and say, look, uh, we might not be your uh, first choice sort of unconsciously, but after we sit down and talk to you about what we've done historically, uh, trust us that you're going to have the best event you could possibly have in Indianapolis. And what's uh, what's coming up? I think there's an unprecedented number of terrific events, uh, really kind of starting with the Big Ten Championship, football championship that's here every year for a while. But the next five years, talk about what's coming to Indianapolis. Yeah, it's a, it's really an incredible lineup. You know, one of the one of the daunting challenges I had when I started this job was it was post Super Bowl, right? I started four years ago. Super Bowl was in 2012, and everyone was saying, "Okay, Ryan, welcome aboard. Uh, what's next?" Um, and there's not a whole lot of what's next when you've just hosted a Super Bowl. <laughs> well, and you also had to follow Allison Malenka, <laughs> right, yeah, if, if memory serves, yeah. which is uh, still still following. We'll ever be following Allison Malenka. She's singularly <laughs> talented, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, we're, the answer to what's next is uh, everything, candidly. I mean, we're, we'll be hosting the 2021 NBA All-Star Game, um, followed six weeks later by the 2021 Men's Final Four, uh, followed several months later by a Big Ten Football Championship, uh, four weeks after that, a College Football National Championship, and a few weeks after that, Men's Big Ten Basketball Tournament. So collectively, those five events in 13 months uh, are going to have uh, equal to or greater impact than the Super Bowl had from a, from an economic impact standpoint. And so really exciting. Uh, um, you know, some of these events are very new to us. Uh, college football we've never hosted. Some we haven't hosted in a long time. The NBA All-Star Game, the last time was 1985. And some we're fortunate enough to uh, to sort of be on the regular calendar for with the men's Final Four. So really, really great stuff. So, so I am a – I'm someone who – doesn't understand or finds it uh, infuriating that we spend all this money on sports and all this money on downtown and why aren't we spending money on x y and z what's your so you're a city councilor this is the rule you're <laughs> <laughs> it's possible <laughs> or i could yeah. be a senator or rep right, from sure. you know kosciuszko yeah. county or something right. but you, i've said this in every podcast i think so i'll say it very quickly when i was a kid i was born in 67 i only came downtown to watch dick the bruiser there was no other reason to come downtown in the 70s i lived downtown you see kids parents bikes dogs strollers it, it's phenomenal how much it's changed But there are still people who say, why do we spend all this money on sports? We don't get anything from it. It's just a plaything for millionaires. Why aren't we filling potholes and hiring cops? Your argument would be? Yeah, so uh, from just a preliminary matter, there's 81,000 people that work in the hospitality industry in Marion and surrounding counties. So, um, you know, that whole industry has existed and grown substantially because of the investments we made 40 years ago around sports. Um, hosting major sporting events has brought the city 
um, national, global attention um, in a very positive light. Um, you know, it's literally physically redeveloped our downtown to way that, to, in a way that's vibrant and connected. So, I mean, you can go from any of these major stadiums to all of these hotels. I mean, go back to 1979. How many hotels were downtown? You know, one. Is the exactly. Answer. Yeah. Um, we now have all of those rooms available to us, which supports, you know, business traffic. It supports, um, you know, traveling for conventions. Obviously, it supports the sports industry. Would there have been a reason to build a new airport? No. If we weren't a destination city for all these events? Absolutely not. Yeah. And, and, and would we have uh, a, attracted companies like Salesforce or, you know, Emphasis um, if, we, if we didn't have the vibrancy in our community that was appealing to the talent they need to fill their own workforce? And the answer to that is no, right? So these are all dominoes, all investments you have to make um, in, in order to be a city which is attractive for investment other than the taxpayer dollars we were just talking about. I also think it's important and, and often misunderstood about the true nature of the investment in sports. You know, the Capital Improvement Board, which, you know, owns Banker's Life Fieldhouse, Lucas Oil Stadium, the Convention Center, Victory Field, um, is largely funded through taxes that are generated from the activities that they host, right? So it's a ticket tax or it's a uh, tax on hotel rooms for the events that they host or a uh, tax on a car rental from a visitor coming in to attend. Um, and, and so, yes, they are tax dollars by their definition, but they're not the tax dollars uh, that we use to repave roads or hire police officers. Those are two totally different streams of revenue. Um, none of our income or property taxes are going to fund um, those sporting activities or those convention activities. Our core income and, and property taxes go to fund the operations of government, the core operations of government. And, you, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned Domino before. Uh, and it's actually just now I was going to actually kind of use that same uh, metaphor. Is it the Pan Am games leads to the building of Hoosier Dome leads to the Colts, Peyton Manning, all these things. I mean, do you, do you get the sense they're just simply all connected that with one of those things, not one building block pulled away that the Jenga of Indianapolis Renaissance in the last generation just doesn't happen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if we weren't aggressively chasing newly formed Olymp Olympic governing bodies in 1979, we would not have been able to host the, the National Sports Festival in 1982. Had we not hosted the National Sports Festival in 1982, we would have had no resume to host the Pan Am Games in 1987, right? So it just keeps going and going and going. The same is true with the organizations, right? So uh, we were such good partners um, to the national governing bodies that allowed us to compete for another very, very important institution, the NCAA, Exactly. In the mid nineties and, and what they've added to our sports economies is, is remarkable. Not only is it all the men's and women's basketball events that we've hosted, but uh, there are fifty four NCAA championships taking place in the state of Indiana, the entire state over the next four years. Uh, that's an incredible economic boost for the Absolutely. entire state, let alone just the city of Indianapolis. Is it is it hard to convince people of this? I mean, are they just like, Well, okay, well whatever, but these guys are worth billions and they don't need our money or you know i don't see the rowing championship therefore it has no effect on my life uh, it's not hard to convince them if you can sit them down with an open mind right <laughs> yeah so if you're listening to this podcast then you're you know you're out there seeking knowledge and wanting to be informed but if uh you know we all have seen people in the community that that, that look for something to be against as a, as a way of defining who they are as opposed to investing sure. investing in the issue and trying to figure it out um but there's really there's no solid argument against what we have done in Indianapolis. Now, I will say, in other cities with different models, um, sometimes the investment could be fairly questioned. You know, if you're using core investment dollars, you know, to build a stadium for a billionaire, um, you know, forty miles away from the core of your downtown, just because you know you want the Dallas Cowboys to be the Dallas Cowboys, even though they're not in Dallas. Um, <laughs> well. Yeah. They're a bad example because he built his own stadium because uh, he could. Sure. But, uh, you know, there's stuff like that 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 is worth arguing about. But what we've done here and how we've made sure that every investment in sports and infrastructure we've made has leveraged the downtown in a positive way and added to it a positive way. Um, I mean, we're the, we're the example they use uh, across the country and you're seeing it uh, across the country. Cities are starting to bring those stadiums back into the core of their downtown. They're reinvesting in these strategies of connected connected walkable authentic uh which we've had for 40 years well it was either 
Mayor Ballard or former Indianapolis Star columnist Bill Benner, or both, who mentioned to us that the initial plan when they were going to build Market Square Arena was to build it out by Lafayette Square, out in Pike Township somewhere. And it was Jim Morris and then Mayor Richard Luger who found federal dollars or a way to use federal dollars to build it downtown. You talk about a game-changing decision. I mean, if Market Square, of course, it wouldn't have been Market Square. It would have been named something else out there. Then that changes the entire dynamic. Do you find that that the fact that everything is so walkable, so connected, so downtown, that that's something that sells Indianapolis, especially if people had already been here? And like, yeah, I get it. It's February, but I never have to leave a heated space. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's and we cultivate that specific experience because it is a huge competitive advantage. So when Mike Greenberg is here, he loves it because it's a two minute walk from um, his private party at 1933 next to St. Elmo's to his suite (laughs) uh, to watch Northwestern play at at the big 10 football championship. Um, And 70% of that is inside, right? Um, Exactly. And so it, it is a huge advantage and something we always highlight in partnership with Visit Indy when we're competing to against other cities to host these events. Two other questions along that, and then we'll move on to some of your other experiences. I remember talking to P.E. McAllister, who was uh, chairman of the, pres- of the Capital Improvement Board for decades, mostly under uh, Hudnut. And he said that when something needed to be done for the city, for downtown, associated under the umbrella of the Capital Improvement Board, there was no politics. There was no R. There was no D. That everybody, I mean, shave off 5% on each side. But everybody agreed. Everybody pulled in the same direction. There was no grandstanding. It's pretty fractured political times in, this, in the country. Do you still find that to be true when it comes to the sports corp and what we're trying to do here? Kind of. Um, you know, I think. One, I think people, and I'm not accusing PE of this, um, the man has a better memory uh, than I do, <laughs> and you know, he's more than twice my age, but I think people remember successes more romantically than they probably actually occurred. So, uh, And it was different because the yeah. Republicans were so in control of sure. everything, basically. Uh, I do think there's still a shared spirit um, of investment in, in the core of our downtown and in our sports strategy, um, regardless of the political aisle. It just occurs differently now, I think. I think it's, um, you know, uh, candidly, I think the quality of our elected officials was greater then um, from an understanding standpoint of how these things work and why, they, why they're why important uh, from an economic standpoint. And so uh, I think the people that still appreciate that, still work hard on it, both from them and, and now, um, work together to get stuff done. It just happens either more quietly or it's just harder. But yeah, sure. I still think it gets done. If What does Indianapolis so project out 10 years or after the five-year run that you're about to have that you described a few seconds ago? What does Indianapolis need to do better to continue this incredible streak of victories? Do you look... We, we, we need to think about this or, man, we need to do this better or, or hey, you know, San Antonio's doing this. Let's figure out how to do what they're doing. Yeah, um, I worry about soccer um, in a big way. It's such a growing sport. We really need to support the growth of soccer in Indianapolis. Um, uh, and whether that's, um, you know, with the current Indy 11 proposal and investing in that and building it out, I think that's going to be really important. Um our success and visit Indy's success, we're, we're tied at the hip. Um, we need one another to be successful in order to sustain all of the uh, retail and entertainment amenities downtown. So when I'm not having a major sporting event, um, the folks at Visit Indy need to have the you know NRA in town. Sure. Um, so that there's a constant flow of, of business and um, a capacity there to build new hotels and, and reinvest in the ones that we have um, for sure. Um, I think, I think we need to, people don't appreciate how bold of a city we were for, for 30 years. Um, they look at us as sort of this, um, city stuck in Indiana in the middle of the Midwest. It's very conservative, all of which was true, but we were actually very progressive in the way that we attacked some of these policies around sports and around investment. Um, and I think we need to adopt a little bit more of that and own it. Um, so whether it's leaning into things like, 
esports. They're getting really aggressive with whatever the future of the downtown mall looks like. Uh, we, you know, um, you know, continuing to invest in public transit, uh, really focusing on quality of life of the surrounding neighborhoods of the core of our downtown. You know, all of that just needs to be really elevated, and and people need to sort of really, I, I think, just kind of look to look look way out there and be on the bleeding edge of what's coming, as opposed to. Uh, I feel like we took our foot off the gas a little bit um, on some of these issues. Is it, will we ever reach the boldness level of building a stadium with no team? Well, I mean, we have a soccer team. We can't seem to build a stadium for it. So. <laughs> well, they're, they're trying to make it right, happen. Yeah, Multiple, right, I mean, yeah, in right. full disclosure, I've done the PR for Ursaw yeah, and Indy yeah. 11 on a few things. So, I mean, uh, I think they're making as good a push as you can possibly make at yeah, this point. No, I agree. And, um, I don't know. I think that's a, just a question of leadership going forward. Um, you know, who's who's going to make that push, um, and what's it look like? And even, you know, even the discussion of building a stadium without a team—that was really a discussion about expanding the convention center, right? Exactly. And so it was ta- it was a discussion about benefiting the entire city year round, not um, not specifically about luring the Colts. And so I think as long as people have that mentality of what's in the best interest of the city that can be sustainable and grow, um, then you have that foundation upon which you can be bold in, in, in the way you work. One last question before we move on, and it's going to uh, serve as a bridge. Hopefully we're going to – actually, we're working in reverse chronology for your career, so forgive me. You're listening to Leaders and Legends podcast. This is Robert Vane sitting down with Indiana Sports Corp President Ryan Vaughn. When you hear – and I heard it when I was in the mayor's office and you heard it when you were in the mayor's office and probably in other places, we can't do everything for Indianapolis, which is heard all the time in the state house, in the media, you say, uh, we're not asking you to right? let us do it for ourselves at the state house. I mean, this notion of uh, local control, uh, it's like a, you know, peacekeeping missile, right? This is not real. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, if they would unlock, um, the revenue streams and diversify them for the cities and give them the autonomy to, you know, create their own destiny. Um, sure. Some would fail, but some would like Indianapolis really succeed. I think, um, the, the, the the revenue streams for the city from a government standpoint are very prescriptive and there's very little dollars for us to um, do initiatives that, uh, that we would like to do um, on our own. So, and I also say, you know, there's just, it's just not true, right? I mean, there are 22 donor counties. And when I say donor counties, 22 counties in the state of Indiana that contribute more to the state of Indiana than they get back um, and actually Indianapolis and Marion County is number two on that list. The poor folks from Evansville down there are, are, are our number one contributors for some reason. But um, And people don't realize that. Indianapolis throws off a lot more than it takes in. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and candidly, the challenges we face are all different. I mean, we're, I mean, we're 400 square miles, but at this point we're almost entirely urban. Um, and the rest of the state, most of the rest of the state is very rural. And so... Uh, we need a different path. We need our own autonomy um, in order to continue to be successful. The first Monday in November 2007, you're preparing, you were running for re-election, if memory serves, as a member of the City County Council. And if I had told you, you know what, Ryan, in about five years, you're going to be chief of staff to Mayor Greg Ballard, your response would have been, knowing that I don't drink alcohol, by the way, <laughs> your response would have been, uh, yeah, no way. What are you, are you kidding me? Right. I mean, uh, I'm assuming this question, even though it's that day and time is, <laughs> is me knowing, not knowing that he was going to win. Cause I didn't believe he was going to win that night. Um, uh, and, and uh, he, he appeared on the podcast and he was uh, his self, his amazing self. And I told him flat out, I didn't think you had a chance in hell. Like I thought he was going to get clobbered. I was the comms director and communications director, of the Indiana Republican party. I volunteer helped him cause he didn't have any money. I thought he was going to get lit up, and it was Kyle Walker, a uh, political genius uh, that he is, who told me about two weeks out that he thought this guy had a chance. Thought the council was going to go Republican for sure, but thought that Ballard had a chance. And I just remember going, you can't be serious. And I was working Channel 8 that night and you know, was working with Shella and Toby McClamrock and Susan Williams, who, as I recall, used to be president of the Indiana Sports Corp. And we were all just stunned to, as someone who's very well versed in politics and as an elect, former elected official, 
tell us about that night and kind of what you thought was happening in the city that led to the probably the biggest upset in Indiana political history. Yeah, that night for me is surreal. It's you know we all have those moments like where were you when, right? And you remember it <laughs> specifically what was happening to you. And and uh, I had a little um, campaign party up in Broad Ripple uh, for the folks that had volunteered for me, and and so I was up there for about an hour thanking folks. And I told my wife Heather, I said, hey, I'm gonna run downtown and thank all the folks in the county party. I mean, they you know we're super helpful here. They need to be down there. They can't be up here. So I drive downtown by myself and I get on Mass Avenue, come down college, turn on to Mass Avenue. My phone rings and it was a, a lawyer who I who's, who's a big time Democrat, uh, Greg Hahn, actually, um, who I was working with at the time. And he says, Ryan, hey, I just wanted to call and congratulate you. You know, he's giving me the whole, you know, spiel like great, great job. You guys did an incredible thing. And I said, <laughs> I, I know said, this is going. I said, uh, I said, Greg, thank you very much. I said, you know, the district sort of leaned Republican. I certainly enjoyed an incumbent advantage. I said, we worked hard. And he just interrupted. He goes, Ryan, I knew you were going to win. I'm talking about the mayor's race. And I said, Greg, what are you talking about? He goes, I just left Democrat Party headquarters. You guys won the mayor's race. (laughs) And I said, are you (laughs) me? (laughs) There are no language restrictions on right, the Leaders yeah, and Legends sorry, yeah. podcast. It, it, no, no, no. It's, it, it, it certainly calls for expletives. Right, yeah. And, uh, in, and I'm, you know, I literally pulled into a parking <laughs> spot on Mass Ave and just finished the phone call and hung up the phone. I thought, that's not, there's no way. I, did, I, I didn't even believe it after he told me that they were. <laughs> so I drive back down. I finally get to the Marat at the time and walk in. And I'm walking in as Greg Ballard um, is walking up behind Carl and, and I stand next Carl to, Brizzy, yeah. f- former Marion County prosecutor. And I and I walk in, and Mark Fisher is standing by the bar. Um, and I walk over to Mark, and and I get a drink. I go, "Is this about to happen?" He goes, he "Goes, yeah. I have no idea what we do now." <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a lot of that yeah. for sure. Yeah. It was uh, that was Tuesday night, and I got a call Wednesday night about, "Hey, can you come help this guy and be his press secretary for the yeah. transition?" And we talked about this a little bit with with mayor ballard that i was getting emails and calls and i think maybe texts were around then i don't remember but like oh my god he's going to ruin the city he's going to destroy everything that we've done which was which was uh equal parts snotty and equal parts kind of ignorant but there was a little bit of like we don't know this dude and i'm like you know he did grow up here what do you think of his eight years of mayor i mean i i think it's fair to say without being condescending at all he vastly outperformed expectations over eight years. As someone whose who's political mind and antenna is as good as anybody's, Ryan, t- just what did you think of the job he did? Extraordinary, uh, honestly. I, I mean, uh, and I had, um, I, I knew him a little bit from the campaign trail. Um, I was obviously running my own campaign and engaged at the council level, which is that's a whole different story that night. Um, but my expectations were, man, we got a lot to learn and, you know, uh, we, you know, big challenges ahead of us. I mean, huge operating budget deficits, crumbling infrastructure, crime on the rise, a police department that had been sort of given to the sheriffs. You know, there were all of these things exactly. that needed to be addressed that were that were huge issues. And um, I was anxious. I was anxious about, you know, what team he was going to put around him. I was anxious because, uh, you know, I had been on the city council for all of over a year. Um, and I was now suddenly one of the most senior members of the new Republican majority <laughs> caucus. Right. I remember you yeah. walking into state party to talk to people about state party to get, cause you replaced someone like in a caucus, right? I did. Yeah. Bradford. Yeah. Jim Bradford. Oh, Jim Bradford. Yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. Um, yeah, we, when we rallied as a, as a new majority caucus, the only member of our caucus who had ever served in the majority was Bob Cochran. He was literally the only counselor that knew what to do. Uh, and and so he naturally became our president year one. (laughs) Um, but you know, everybody came together, uh, really with the right attitude. And then the thing that I think sticks out the most about the mayor, um, and I knew this when I was council president, worked closely with him, but I, I got to live it when I was his chief of staff is that. Uh, and you know this as his comms director, like there's nothing more that, than he hated about than having a discussion about a message, right? If you came to him and said, you need to do X, Y, and Z because people will say this about you, you, you had already lost the argument. Um, you had to go with him and say, this is the right thing to do and this is why we should do it. And that was always what drove whatever he did. 
Um, and I used to tell people when I was chief of staff, they'd come to me with a problem, and, and I had this silver, silver bullet theory. You know, if you and I disagree, um, you know, we, we both have one other boss to go check with, and he'll make the decision. But don't you dare walk out in there without knowing the answer to, the, to this question, which is what's the right thing to do? Because if you walk in there and say, well, this is what so-and-so will say if you do X, um, you know, he, he's going to be furious. Yeah. Well, and he, you know, that's a thousand percent correct. I mean, and, and doing, doing, you know, messaging for Greg Ballard is, is like trying to grow hair on Mr. Clean. I mean, it's so <laughs> sorry, mayor, if you're listening, cause I bet you probably will listen to this one cause it's Ryan, <laughs> yes. but you know, he was not treated well by the media in the seven campaign. Uh, and you know, they didn't think he was going to win and you know, for good reason. I mean, the, Anyone who says that Bart Peterson was not a good mayor is, I think he was a terrific mayor for, for 95%. And then, you know, what happened in the summer and fall of 07 took everybody by surprise. I mean, it took almost everybody, I guess, by surprise. But, but the mayor always asked, what's the best thing for the city? What's the best thing for the city? And it led him to make some really bold decisions. Uh, the transfer of the water utility probably being number one. Um, you know, if, if Greg Ballard doesn't greenlight it, we don't go after the Super Bowl bid. And so I, the, the one thing that I thought that was underrated about the mayor that people didn't factor in when they discussed him was how much he had traveled. He had been to all these huge cities throughout the world because of his career in the United States Marine Corps. And he saw how Stuttgart did it and how London did it and Paris did it. And he also had young kids, you know, really smart, college-educated kids. And, and those two things, I think, really drove him. And, and talk about how you interacted with him on that with regard to what do young people want and what are other cities doing really well. And I think that he's, he's not given enough credit for bringing that vision from other places here at Indianapolis. Is that fair statement or no? Absolutely fair statement. You know, he, he, um, he was sort of painted as this massively inexperienced, um, you know, a borderline sort of like ignorant of city government, uh, candidate and mayor, referred to as the accidental mayor, right? Not even credit for doing anything to, to, to be, <laughs> you know, progressive about being the mayor. Um, and you, you hit on something which I think uh, certainly surprised me. And, and candidly, I didn't give him credit for before he became mayor. And, and certainly my boss is that global experience uh, fed so many policies um, that, you know, candidly weren't very Republican, but they were very, nece- exactly. very necessary for the city and its, and its success. Um, and you know, bike lanes is a great example, um, you know, of my ignorance and his brilliance. You know, when I was on the city council and president, we did this wastewater utility transfer and, you know, it netted about $400 million for us to then reinvest in infrastructure and we're ready to, you know, plow down roads and repave them and build trails and sidewalks and, um, you know, he comes down with this philosophy that we're not going to build a um, a major street thoroughfare without a bike lane. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> no one in Indianapolis rides bikes. You know, it's freezing. You know, um, you know, half the time here we don't have a strong bike culture, and here we are eight years later, and I ride 12 miles to work every day. <laughs> right. So uh, and I've if, seen you on your look, pacer look, bike, look, yeah, right. going it, from meeting to meeting. Right. It and it it's it was it was transformative. It was something they got pushed back for. Uh, but he had seen that bike culture in other cities. Um, throughout the country, uh, Georgia Street's a great example. You know, Georgia Street gets built, um, you know, for the Super Bowl, and and it's part of the vision around this. You know, bringing federal dollars again to kind of make this happen, and uh, you know, and and you could hear him talk about similar places in other major cities, and how excited and how convinced he was it was going to be transformative. And by the way, how right he was. Um, it was you know the home of the Super Bowl Village, which had never existed in a Super Bowl before is now a required element of every Super Bowl after. Yeah, Benner said that. So yeah. you completely redef- redefined what's expected of cities when they host Super Bowls. Yeah. Uh, that It actually reminds me of a phone call I had with the mayor, too. I, he was When I was chief of staff, he was traveling overseas. He was in Barcelona, and he was standing on the street that Georgia Street was basically modeled after. Um, and he was there receiving an award for an Innovator of the Year award. Uh, and I'm talking to him, and he's sort of describing the street. And he's like, this is exactly how Georgia Street was built. I'm like, that's great. I said, uh, 
what are you and Winnie doing tonight in Barcelona? He goes, oh, we're going to KFC. <laughs> <laughs> he literally went to Kentucky Fried Chicken in Barcelona, Spain. <laughs> yeah, the, you know, the, the, the food bill for the Ballard administration wasn't, you know, wasn't particularly um, high. That's, that's what I sure. loved about him. He was like every, every guy you know and every guy you want to hang out with. But he was also so sharp and so innovative. Uh, in ways that you wouldn't expect. And people would, you know, I would say this, his his re-election in 11, to me, is more impressive than his election in 7. You know, you can run up behind someone and, you know, clock them on the back of the head, knock them out, and then run away. That's one thing. But to go toe-to-toe for four years and, and fight, you know, which is a formidable political machine in Marion County, the, the Democrat Party, and win three years after... Barack Obama carries the county by 120,000 votes with all these new registrants. Now, whether they choose not to turn up for ma- turn out for mayor, that's one thing. But they're there. They're on the rolls. For him to win 11, to me, is more remarkable than his win in seven. Am I right or wrong? Uh, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, his character is what stood out and made that possible. Certainly his accomplishments. So he had done a lot with regard to public safety. He had done a lot with regard to, regard to infrastructure. But... The old playbook didn't work. And the old playbook was, hey, I'm going to call this guy corrupt. Exactly. And no one, no one believed that Greg it, Ballard is corrupt. It takes, it takes a lot to convince people that a Marine Corps officer is on the take. Right. Like, it takes a lot. And I, I've said this a hundred times. If Greg Ballard, when he was mayor, so not now, but when he was mayor, walked in a restaurant, you, you wouldn't know if he was the mayor or he just got done pitching underhand softball at the over 50 league. And that's part of his body type. Sorry, Colonel. And part of it is his demeanor, his personality. I think actually quite candidly uh, in a different way, uh, Governor Holcomb is the same way. He's so laid back, so personable, so easy to talk to that he connects with people in ways that, that someone who's more programmed and maybe a better or more experienced politician perhaps can't. There's, there's no switch. He's the same guy in a boardroom of 50 corporate executives as he is in a foursome with his, golf, his Marine Corps golf buddies. <laughs> He's the exact right. same guy, right? There's no switch that turns on and you get that sort of like no, it, phony political And speak. as a comms guy, it's like, well, can you flip the switch? <laughs> to your point, there right. is no switch. Right. Uh, before you became, and you were in the, talked about city county council, but you also had another kind of formative experience we want to talk about for a few minutes before we end up. Uh, the podcast you're listening to leaders and legends with indiana sports court president ryan vaughn you were a prosecutor how, how did you get into that job and how did that job help you in the jobs that you've had since then yeah so my goal growing up was to be uh, you know the world's biggest baddest richest civil litigator you know I, I fall in love with all those movies of people pounding courtroom tables and flying in private jets and <laughs> you know as a kid on the west side that seemed like a pretty good life to me and so uh, I you know I went through college and law school and in law school I thought well if I'm going to be a civil litigator I, I really need to get some trial experience right I want to come out and right out of the gate and you know go conquer the world and so there was a program that allowed you to be what they call a certified intern so you, you were still in law school, but you could practice law under the supervision of an attorney uh, as a prosecutor. And so I thought, well, I, I can go do that. Um, so I signed up, um, ended up becoming a certified intern in the prosecutor's office and just loved the work. I mean, it was so fun um, being in trial, sort of wrapping your head around these criminal cases. Um, that office, uh, I have a lot of respect for the folks that still work there. Um, I mean, you're handling literally hundreds of different cases at any given moment and the pay Um, is not commensurate with your responsibility no i mean when i graduated law school which was in 2003 and became a full-time deputy prosecutor uh, with the generous reward of twenty nine thousand dollars a year um (laughs) and you literally have families like depending on you for justice like absolutely this guy killed my son or this you know this man did x to my daughter or whatever and so it's not without its own pressures yeah and so I was there four years and um, kind of graduated up the ranks from, you know, public intoxication cases to murder trials. Um, and I had an experience one fall month where I literally did three major felony jury trials of the same village pantry on the east side <laughs> <laughs> and thought to myself, well, uh, you, you don't get certified as a village pantry until <laughs> right, on the east side right. until there's a felony committed. 
Uh, As someone who used to live at 16th uh, and Linwood. Yeah. So uh, at that point, I said to myself, you know, hey, I've, I've sort of reached the point of diminishing returns on the uh, growth as an attorney. And so it's time for me to leave and go, uh, you know, accomplish my, my lifetime goal of being a rich private lawyer. And so I left and I went into a private firm and um, uh, six months into it, I, I just wanted to eat a bullet. Uh, it was it was terrible. Um, just had, boring, or just not the reward that you thought. Uh, two things, two things that I've discovered about me that that experience taught me that have really guided every decision that I've made professionally going forward. The first was, I went from having ninety major felony cases that I was working on at any given point to uh, working on two construction litigation cases for a year straight. Um, and so I was much, much happier trying to spin as many plates as possible, being confronted with different fact patterns, moving quickly, sure. uh, being in court than I was stuck behind a computer reviewing documents, doing discovery. I need to be busy with a lot of things at, at once as opposed to just solely focused on one at a time. And I'm, I'm better um, professionally when I'm doing that. The second, and this is really the one I think has been the most instructive for me, is uh, I didn't appreciate while I was a prosecutor how emotionally rewarding that experience was for me until I couldn't do it anymore. Really? Uh, there was something about, you know, sort of serving the community, feeling like you were chasing justice, sticking up for these families. That's really the moment the light bulb went off for me that, hey, I've got, I've got a, an actual heart and passion for community service here that I got, I've got to find an outlet for. Um, and so, uh, you know, I called then elected prosecutor Carl Brizzy and I said, look, I, I need that again. Like how, how, at, at this point in my life, I wasn't at all involved in politics. I was just practicing law, trying to get rich. <laughs> um, uh, I, and I called Carl and I said, "Hey, I, I need that. Is there, you know, are there cases I can take on the side? Is there a way I could help?" He's like, "Ryan, that's illegal. You should know that." Um, I said, oh yes. He goes, uh, "You're at the track. That's right. That day yeah, at that's law right. school." He said, uh, "But you could work on my campaign. Um, you know, I'm going into re-election, and you could give that a shot." And so I said, "Sure." So I. You know, spent evenings. I knew I still needed to stay as a private lawyer and develop. I spent my evenings um, working at the county party. You know, putting stamps on envelopes, knocking on doors. Um, you name it. Got to meet a whole new network of people who had that same kind of passion that I did around trying to help the community. Um, and you know, one thing led to another. That led to a replacing Jim Bradford on the council, and so forth and so on. And you meet you meet the best. It gets a bad rap, and and you know, eh, you can't you can't really defend. And by it, I mean politics about everything. But whenever I speak to a college class, which I just did a few days ago, actually, along with a couple others, Megan Robertson, who's your close friend, and Lara Beck, who's my close friend, I, the last thing I told the the class uh, of college kids was there were two things: one, don't lose your sense of humor because you're really going to need it, and number two is. Don't be afraid to be friends with someone on the other side of the aisle because you never know. The the friends I've met in politics, Republican and Democrat and Libertarian, Mr. Spangle, are amazing. They're some of the best friends I've ever had in my entire life or will have. And, and you know, your point about being involved in, in the people you've met in, in your path. And I know your friends because a lot of them are the mutual friends. And whether it's Melissa Thompson or Jessica Higdon or Megan Robertson or Jason Dudich or the list goes on and on, they're absolutely wonderful people. And I somewhat feel sorry for folks who are so jaded or turned off about politics that they don't get involved because they miss that opportunity. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Um, when I speak to college class, I, I tell them two things. One, if, if you care at all about your community, don't think that politics are a bad way to get involved. Politics are a great way to get involved. Figure out where you stand. And by the way, like you don't have to be the extreme left or the extreme right. You could be like 90% of us are <laughs> kind of right down the middle on a exactly. lot of these issues. The second thing I tell them is um, take a job in government right away um, because you get to understand your government in a way that, that the people that don't work in it can't. Um, and if you take that job right away, you're already poor. So you're used to not making any money. So that's good. <laughs> and you get tremendous leadership opportunities and a tremendous network um, when you work in government because so many, so many people, so many industries um, touch government in some way, shape or form. You, you just learn a lot. Um, and I, I was glad I did that early, even though I didn't stay in the criminal world um, 
criminal prosecution world, just to be clear. Uh, <laughs> even though I didn't stay in that world, th- that was my path to politics, which has, uh, to your point, really given me just incredible life experiences. We didn't mean to, as we close uh, this part of the Legion of Legend podcast with Ryan Vaughn and move on to the five questions, it didn't mean to skip over the fact that you went to Wabash along with every other Republican I know, or pretty damn close. Uh, but I want to ask one other thing very quickly, and it's personal, and, and you can answer it as shortly as possible. My understanding is that you are married to your high school sweetheart. Is that correct? That is correct, yeah. What is that like? Uh, it's I'm the luckiest man alive. It's like winning, winning the lottery on the first ticket. Um, you know, we met in junior high. We started dating, if you could call it that, when we were 15, and we've literally never been apart. Um, she's been super special part of my life um, all the way through. You know, college. She went to all of my swim meets. I mean, I, I didn't even want to go to some of my swim meets. Um, <laughs> you know, she she worked uh, tirelessly uh, while I was in law school to help support us and pay for our mortgage. Um, she's been an incredible friend, companion. Um, I literally, we have spent far more of half of our lives together. So to, to even think about, um, trying to compare it to not being with her, it just, just doesn't make sense. Well, we appreciate the fact that you are, uh, spending your Valentine's day with us here at leaders <laughs> and legends <laughs> and, and, and Ryan's talking about Heather Vaughn and she's an incredibly engaging and warm person. And on behalf of all of us who know you. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we we would never mind if the words uh, first lady were put in front of Heather's name (laughs) and you can choose the office. (laughs) Thank you, Ryan, uh, for going through your career and everything that you've done. And it's not even close to being finished. And we've come to the five question segment of Leaders and Legends. We ask the same five questions of everybody. I recently changed the first question because I didn't like it. So we're going to start with that. First question of the five questions, Leaders and Legends podcast. What was your first job? Um, first job was a lifeguard. Um, I also, at the same time, was a blimpy sandwich artist. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't blimpy in those little red shorts, though, were you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Off of uh, out the speedway, Blim- blimpy sandwich artist. Because yeah. you, you grew up on the west side, went to Ben Davis, so I, I recall, did. is yep. that correct? And I grew up on the east side, and we thought everybody from the west side was basically one step away from Juvie, which is interesting right. because Juvie's on the east side. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the second question is, what was your first concert? Uh, MC Hammer, opening act, <laughs> Vanilla Ice. <laughs> <laughs> About 1990? Yeah, I have no idea what it was, but uh, yeah, that, uh, that, that is unfortunately true. So is it more impressive that Heather stayed with you through that <laughs> right. and all of these meetings right. in law school? I actually then saw Vanilla Ice for a second time uh, for a $5 cover at a bar in Texas about <laughs> six years later. <laughs> if you could recommend one book to anyone to read, which book would you recommend? Oh, that's tough. Um that's real tough. I think my favorite book um, is probably still Sea Biscuit. Oh, really? Why? I just love the story. Um, it's sort of the you know the horse that no one wanted that trained and became dominant, and you know um, that that time in the country when you know the economy was terrible and people were starving, and how they could sort of rallied around the rallied around Sea Biscuit, and then uh, he of course is tragically injured, and they write him off for a second time, and he comes back and. Um, you know, beats man of war. It's just, to me, it's just a constant sort of fall down, get back up story. And, and it, it reads really, really well. I, I just thought it was great. That's a great choice. Uh, is the movie as good as the book? Never. Right. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, the, book is, the book is fantastic. Yeah. If you could witness any event in history, like be there when it happened, which event would you choose? Uh, that's already happened or that, that any event in history, any it's event. already happened. And be there by that, I mean, not watch on television, but actually be in the room, on the street. Yeah, I, I think I would like to watch everybody sign the Declaration of Independence. I mean, that's a pretty cool, seminal moment um, in world history, um, let alone American history. Um, and just sort of hear the discussion and the thoughts and arguments that are, went around, um, you know, what 
why those particular principles were adopted and, and why these men were so focused on making it a reality. Um, and you forget what they put on the line. Like they all knew they would get hanged. Absolutely. If they lost. Yeah, they, they were committing treason. <laughs> <laughs> if yeah. you could, last question of the five questions, if you could have dinner with anyone in the world for a couple hours just to chat, who would you choose? Whom would you choose? Mm, my wife, I think. Yeah. That's Greg Ballard's answer. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. I, um, it's, it's, it's tough. People get busy to carve out time and spend time with um, your loved ones. Um, yeah. If, if we're asking about famous people. Um, we should just have a disclaimer. You can't choose anyone you're related to. Because the mayor, the mayor Ballard thought about it for 30 seconds and he goes, okay, Winnie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, I always feel uh, like I've learned something really special when I am listening to Mitch Daniels talk. Um, and I think if I could just have two hours one-on-one with Mitch and get his thoughts on leadership and government and uh, civic duty, um, I, I just find him incredibly insightful. Well, I, I would imagine that he's going to be an answer to that question more than once as we continue on these podcasts. He's probably the best communicator I've ever seen in person yeah. for sure. When he gives a speech, you walk away going, well, how, why doesn't everyone believe that? Like exactly. that's so incredibly <laughs> like brilliant. Yeah. Why don't we all just do that? And how come that never occurred to me? <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah, that's exactly right. right. Uh, it would be unfair to call Ryan uh, Vaughn uh, the best leader of his generation in the city because he's quite simply one of the best leaders in the entire city, regardless of generation. Uh, we all look up to you. We're all very happy for your success and we're looking for more. Thank you very much for joining us today on the leaders and legends podcast. Well, I appreciate it. And, um, and I'm sure the mayor said this cause I know he believes it and I believe it too, but, um, all of the, all of the success that I've had personally or professionally has been a result of just a great network of people like yourself and all those folks that you mentioned that have just been supportive and um, encouraging. And so I'm blessed to be here and uh, hope not to let you guys down. Thank you very much. We'll hope to have you on again. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Thank you.